The Audemars Piguet Royal Oak, a watch that now sits as one of the most desired steel sports watches in the world. Their demand has skyrocketed thanks to the likes of this platform, social media and influencers dictating the market. But we're not going to discuss that. Those points aren't as important as the piece itself. After many years of studying up on watches, learning about their designs, their influences, their histories, the one watch that continually draws me in and pushes me away is the Royal Oak. I don't even know what to call it anymore. My arch nemesis, my adversary, my ex-wife. The major creation of famed watch designer Gerald Genter. His first attempt at creating and founding the dress sports watch that began an entire movement. Is it ugly? Is it gorgeous? Dated? Modern? Perfect? Flawed? What is it? How can it best be described fairly? That is where most of us struggle. Defining the design of this watch is very difficult. Defining its purpose, its application. The simple way to approach watches is to put them into categories. Each piece has a tier that they fall into, a genre. If we were to break down their tiers into the most basic of categories, we are left with sports watches on one side and dress watches on the other. What defines them? That is what gets difficult at times, because we have seen just how these lines have begun to blur with modern pieces. The modern trend is to combine elements that we used to find on dress pieces with the characteristics of a sports watch. So we find steel sports watches now using rubber straps that help dress them down. We see gold and steel implemented into sports cases. The common trend is moving further away from dress watches and more towards sports pieces, simply because that is what the market demands. And if we were to really point the finger at the watch that began this trend, we could argue that the AP Royal Oak is what started it all. The story has been told many times before, that the landscape that defined dress and sports watches in the 70s was clear-cut. But the boldest attempt was creating a watch out of steel that would compete with the likes of gold watches in price. People thought it was ridiculous. The Royal Oak had meagre sales in the beginning, but soon had its own identity. It very much broke the mold and, after it became a success, other brands began to follow suit, piggybacking off the watch's achievement. The one watch that is always compared against the Royal Oak is the Patek Philippe Nautilus. Of all the watch comparisons that we see nowadays, the pairing of these two watches is actually very valid, because they were designed by the same person at different stages in his life. Sharing our attention between the Royal Oak and the Nautilus, compassion and emotion aside, the Royal Oak visually does not look like a watch that has aged as well as the Nautilus. We could rationalize this by saying that the Royal Oak was a prototype, a first edition, limited by the tolerances and capabilities of machine manufacturing at the time, and the Nautilus was a more sculptured, streamlined transformation of Genta's original thought. But this is difficult to say, now especially because we are seeing a revival of this styling in other parts of the creative industry. But both watches share the same identity of pieces that were made in the 70s. They both still have that DNA in them. We see just how the landscape has changed since then. How, over the last few years, these watches have been elevated to unattainable heights. And often, how these two pieces are heralded as some of the best designed watches in history. Is it all hype? Or is there some validity to these claims? So what does the Royal Oak communicate on first impressions? Industrial, hard-edged, masculine, those seem to be the key words that we could assign to it, especially to the larger counterparts. There is this brutalism to its many surfaces, and it does have a reference to the brutalist architecture movement that became popular in the 50s and 60s. Visually, it shows no real care about it being made suitable to be worn on the wrist. It visually looks uncomfortable. Every single edge on the case is sharp, angular. There is a great emphasis to remove as many circular forms as possible from its appearance. And since its influence came from a porthole design, the watch relies on octagonal and hexagonal elements to make up its presence. With such a great emphasis on sharpness, harshness even, the watch can come across as something really ugly. The sheer aggression that the case and bracelet gives off can affect the way people look at it, at first and the quote-unquote ugliness we should address. The simpler variants of the Royal Oak, like the reference 15202, is able to downplay its presence, and so attracts the least amount of attention for the most part. The harshness of the lines are downplayed by its scale, and that, I believe, was the intent of the original Jumbo, 
Size and scale for a watch of this nature is important. When these are scaled up, like the 15400, the hardness becomes more apparent. And one of the easiest pieces to really criticize is the chronograph. These watches add more to the Royal Oak structure, with integrated crown guards, pushes, more brutality on the many new surfaces. Even here, the execution is excellent, primarily because the added elements do not detract from the initial design. With inclusions of more hexagonal components like the pushes, the symmetrical placement of the subdials, there is so much more about the watch that accentuates the Royal Oak name. And the offshore line continues to expand this attitude, greater size, greater presence, an increase in aggression. Admittedly, some of these variants do take the brutalism too far. They keep to the original aesthetic, but tend to overemphasize the parts that made the subtlety of the original watches so great. But in saying that, they do look surprisingly modern for what they offer, with a much more open attitude towards customizing alternating straps and case materials. Now beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And here is when we start to see the conundrum. The Royal Oak splits the community. Like any brand, it will not win everyone over. Many say that it is just hype that has helped push this piece into the realms it has positioned itself into. But unlike other companies that in recent years have hyped themselves up as unobtainable objects, the Royal Oak is one reference that truly deserves a status above most, even more than the Patek Nautilus. In a few words, it established the appeal of a steel sports watch as something of luxury. It celebrated steel as the primary material choice. Now, of course, that opens another can of worms. Would steel watches be as popular today if it wasn't for this watch? That is difficult to say. Did this watch at least start the movement towards this appeal? Absolutely. Is it a good thing that stainless steel is now the base material for practically every family of luxury or entry-level watches on the market? That is another point of contention. One company selling their product for 20,000 and another for 200, with essentially both using the same materials. Now to address the thoughts that I have about the watch in a poignant manner. There are days when the Royal Oak design truly fascinates me, just because of its meticulous approach of addressing how each part coincides. Though its design can look rough around the edges, downright ugly to some, the relationship between the bezel, case and bracelet is unmatched by any other name in the sports genre. The relationship that they have is what makes the piece look so integral. The parts have this visual marriage between them that translates throughout the piece. But there are also days when I think that the piece is an abomination because of its appearance. Sometimes it is a watch that I just find ugly. Often, I keep asking myself why this approach was used. What other options were there? Could it not have been less angular and smoother, less harsh? Then it comes down to the styling. It gives off such a strong impression that it is a piece from another time. Here's the thing though, whether it is a design from the 70s or a design from the year 2100, it's very difficult to pinpoint. The Royal Oak very much established its own language then. We like to use the word retro-modern, but we could also say that it is incredibly futuristic, bypassing the typical fluid shape and rounded forms that we see so often today and instead goes straight into the realms of an impressionist future. It transcended the time period when it was conceived, and that alone is a strong enough basis for the watch's now iconic status. If we then move to its position as a balance between being a sports watch and a dress watch, the Royal Oak again is one of the first steel pieces to really define that category. Up until then, the split was well defined. But this new concept ushered into a new era of creative potential. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It undoubtedly was a cause for concern. And since then, we see just how any watch could be considered applicable for both scenarios. Even here, the lines are blurred. A watch like the Cartier Tank, the Cartier Santos and JLC Reverso. Yes, they look like dress watches, but could double as sports watches in many scenarios nowadays. These pieces were established at the time to be sports watches, but obviously were built under the guise of being dress pieces. We transition to the Blancpain 50 Fathoms, the Rolex Submariner, the AP Royal Oak. Three very distinct steel sports watches with a different standing in the category. 
The Blancpain 50 Fathoms, an instrument designed purely with the intention of being used by armed forces, and spent much of its developmental life in service. Pure function, no real fashion. The Rolex Submariner originally was designed to be used in the sea, but made to be elegant enough to work with formal attire. Hence why the sizes and dimensions of the original watches were considered thin and undersized at the time. Function and fashion blended together. The AP Royal Oak was designed to be a dress watch that married sports watch materials into an elegant form, built to be ultra thin with a bracelet design that remains unmatched in quality today. It set an entirely new standard. Is everything about this watch perfect? You know what I'm going to say. Does it make sense as a perfect everyday wearing watch for the more rugged individual? Not really. Is it a watch that can be worn heavily and keep its gorgeous finishing? Not at all. Picture yourself climbing a mountain with this on and making contact with a rock face. Think about the once perfectly formed bezel with a huge chunk taken out of it. Nails scraping down a chalkboard. So then it's not a perfectly suited sports watch. That's where models like the Offshore step in. So to bring the discussion back, looking at both loving and hating the watch, I feel so divided by the Royal Oak. From a stylistic, creative point of view, from an appreciative point of view, and one that questions the overall execution of its design, there is so much here to admire, so much to love. At the same time, the design, though unique and ambitious, is also brutal, aggressive. It doesn't give off the feeling of being this smooth, organic form that we accept as something completely visually pleasing. In that way, at times I find it ugly, an abomination to all that is sacred. I hate the design, purely because after all this time, it still doesn't make perfect sense to me. And like the best types of design and works of art, they need to be polarizing and inviting. My philosophy is that if a design of the object keeps bringing you back for more, keeps you returning and thinking about what made it so inviting in the first place, then you have something truly masterful in your hands. This we can all agree on though, the watches, whether time and date, chronographs, perpetual calendars, offshore variants, are all made with terrific attention to detail. Each piece is constructed and finished with such an artisanal quality about them. And one of the greatest ironies of all is that none of the above thoughts must have passed through the mind of the designer or the team responsible for bringing this watch to life in the beginning. Sure, they wanted to keep their excellent standards, but nobody had the idea that the Royal Oak would somehow disrupt and very much revolutionize the watch market for years to come. So in answering the question, as to why you should both hate and love the design of the Audemars Piguet Royal Oak, well, it's because its design is that good. Whether time and date only, chronographs, perpetual calendars, overseas variants, are all made, not overseas, offshore, man, you idiot. That would have ended up badly.